The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. So, Julie, we are going to be talking to uh, a returning guest, and uh, he's actually uh, done an incredible amount of books and uh, information in true crime. And uh, let's just bring him on so that we can talk about his uh, history. So, uh, Peter Vronsky, thank you for being here. Uh, hi, Alan. Hi, Julie. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, you're welcome. It's good to speak to you. Wow, you've got, um, I, I, keep, I always, every time I uh, have you on and I'm going through your list of books, man, you've, uh, you've done an incredible amount of work. Now, you, you are also uh, an historian and you teach at the University of Toronto still, or do you not? Um, yeah, no, my, my degree is from the University of Toronto. I teach at Ryerson University in Toronto. It's another university here. And, and you're doing... Um, what, what do you teach? You're teaching in criminal justice or history? I teach um, all sorts of history courses. Uh, you know, my, my degree is in uh, espionage in international relations and uh, criminal justice history. So I teach things like the history of terrorism, uh, the history of espionage, uh, war crimes, um, genocide. So, uh, you know, combination of military espionage. Um, history, as I say, history of terrorism and guerrilla groups and so forth. So, so you're. Actually, so I don't teach. <laughs> I don't teach formally anything in terms of serial homicide. Yeah, well, you, but you're, you, there must be a lot of stuff for you nowadays. With, with um, as as a historian of serial homicide. Well, that, but I'm also thinking of terrorism and. Uh, just, yes, of course. Just the whole... Yeah, well, I mean, as we live in the age of terror, um, everybody wants kind of a historical um, context to it. Uh, you know, the feeling is that it's something new, but in fact we've been living with terrorists since the biblical, since the biblical age, since the Sicarii, the Zealots, and, and, and so forth. So, um, you know, basically when we teach the history of uh, terrorism, kind of the standard... Uh, syllabus is is that we've been living with terrorism for two thousand years, and it's very much ingrained in our political system and how things uh, happen on um, you know both in nationally and internationally. It's not a freak kind of thing. It feels for us uh, as North Americans since nine eleven. You know, the terrorism is something unusual, but actually, it's not that unusual. I just I, I just wonder on how how many fronts you have to go with with terrorism now because there's homemade terrorism there's you know the uh, uh, ISIS right. and there's uh, there's so many different groups now for different there's reasons. animal rights terrorists there's environmental terrorists there are racial terrorists there are visionaries missionaries it's almost like categorizing serial killers you know in some ways. You know, those terrorists that don't blow themselves up, um, they're a species of serial killer in that they repeatedly kill with a cooling off period in between. Um, their motives may be slightly different, but, but you know, for all intents and purposes, they, they, they too are serial killers. That's interesting. Do you think there's a difference in the type of serial killer or even terrorist as far as the culture, like do, do, do German serial killers behave different than, let's say, American serial killers? Oh, absolutely. Um, culture, the environment, the history of the time in which the serial killing is taking place has a lot to do with where it's taking place, right down to kind of serial killers' uh, pathologies and how you profile them. You know, you have, you know, for example, you have a species of serial killer in, in South Africa um, that practices these kinds of muti rituals, right? So, so that's a unique species of serial killer that's unique to the kind of beliefs 
and culture of that part of, of the world. Um, in China, for example, uh, rural illegal immigrants into the city are targeted by serial killers. Um, so, so you have kind of economic and social cultural um, conditions where victims are kind of devalued and, and, and chosen. You know, most serial killers often will target a, 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 the kind of victim that society looks down upon. You know, prostitutes, homeless people, um, inner city poor, and so far, um, are usually the victims of, of, of serial killers, marginalized people. Um, and, and so it's the very people who are targeted are the ones that society often uh, looks down. You know, just the way that Jack the Ripper was killing uh, prostitutes in Whitechapel. Uh, it's not surprising, or, or you know, you have uh, uh, street people targeted in Los Angeles. Uh, so, so definitely, definitely, uh, a, the nature of the serial killer is is partly determined by uh, the place and time they're living in, and then you have a kind of a general human psychology that that works in the other part. So, so could we uh, t transpose that? Can we make that so that, um, you know, so for instance in Australia here, um, they had the Port Arthur um, massacre, and then they did the big gun recall and restrictions, and it seems to have curbed the appetite of that type of behavior. But do you think that the North American, and I say specifically American culture, that it would actually work for something in that in that atmosphere. Well, you know, uh, you're you're talking to a Canadian, right. uh, and, and and so uh, you know, in some ways, our our language is the same, our our you know religions are the same. There's there's very very similar cultural aspects between Canadians and Americans, and and yet. We have a very low incidence of, uh, you know, gun crimes, uh, of massacres like that. So, um, why is it in the United States that, that that there is such a high rate of incidence? And, and and yeah, indeed, I think it is something in the American culture where the right to bear arms, um, and the implication of the right to bear arms. Uh, is that it's not only the right to bear arms, but the right to use those arms uh, when uh, you deem it appropriate. Uh, <laughs> you know? and, and, and so you already have this kind of cultural psychology uh, that you know, says that it's enshrined in the Constitution that every American has the right to have these weapons and for the eventual possibility that they may need to use them. And then, of course, the psychology kicks in. Uh, and that's where the mass shooter makes that decision on his own or her own uh, um, agenda as to when is the right moment for them as a citizen to exercise their right. So that kind of constitutional psychological link, of course, does not exist in Canada, where you don't have the right to bear arms. To bear arms is a privilege, right? Um, as it was in England and, and, and so forth. Not a constitutional right. And, and, and so I think it immediately sets up a whole different psychological dynamic when it comes to that moment where an individual feels that either they're a victim of uh, some kind of plot or a conspiracy or rage, and the way to express that rage is to use the weapons that they have the right to, you know, to bear. And, and, and so I think that's a very big um, issue, uh, you know, especially where it seems like that, you know, that, 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 that uh, you know, amendment um, seems to be unchallengeable. I mean, we're constantly changing the Constitution, uh, why is it that this particular article of the Constitution seems to be enshrined as, as never, you know, if you ever amend it, that means you're, you're absolutely um, eliminating the notion of liberty in, in, in America. So, you know, the psychology, the cultural framework behind 
that kind of uh, thinking, of course, is is you know over over centuries ingrained in 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 the United States. So just that little change of geography, crossing the border from Canada to to <laughs> you yeah. know you the United the States changes everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Peter, I was just thinking, as I was listening to you talking about the psychological influences, there are many occasions where when we are looking at profiling or trying to predict somebody's, an individual's actions in the future, we look at the past and their environment and culture, and or if, for example, they've, like a serial killer, they've done, they've, um, done various, um, I don't know, committed various acts of a crime, whether that be burglaries or, or, or murder or... We look at those past burglars to try and predict and enable us to call them to justice. With terrorism nowadays, how much more difficult is that given the just the extent of the groups, the terrorist groups, when we're trying to use previous behaviours to predict the future events? Well, you know, the, the difficulty in uh, kind of predicting um, the future is, is that the present is in constant change. So as as, you know, as as the present changes, the, the predictability of the future begins to 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 shift. Um, the other, of course, the the thing that we most most fear today, I think, is the self radicalized terrorist, and 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 that's a new phenomenon that's um, you know related to the emergence of this uh, technology. Uh, so. Certainly, I think, you know, terrorist actors were easier to identify and profile and predict in, in, in the past. Um, you know, as Karl Marx said, history repeats itself. Um, first time is tragedy, second time is farce. Um, so we've had, as I say, from the Sikiari in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago to the Hashashin, uh, the assassins in, in the medieval era, kind of these Islamic ninjas to the Wahhabis during, um, you know, the conquest of the Saudi Peninsula in the 1920s, um, to, uh, Zionist Jewish terrorists that had founded a nation to Nelson Mandela, who, you know, technically is, you know, is defined as a terrorist, was arrested as a terrorist and, um, a you know, approved car bombings while he was sitting in uh, jail. What is a terrorist often depends on what side of the barrel you're standing, whether you're in front of it or behind it. You know, you know that famous saying, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. <laughs> um, and, and, and so the politics often of these events are very similar and very predictable. You know, in the way that you have child abuse in a serial killer's early history, you often have political repression in a terrorist's early history. Um, and, and whether they're labeled as a terrorist depends, as I say, on what side of that line you stand. You know, uh, Jewish resistors in, in, to the Holocaust in the Warsaw Ghetto were executed as terrorists by the Nazis. Um, so it's who's calling what, you know, who's calling the shots, essentially. But the one predictable thing is is that terrorism emerges out of a repression of, of, of a people, out of colonization. I mean, I would say a lot of terrorist movements, uh, you know, certainly political terrorist movements, really are kind of ethnic nationalist uh, people's movements who are seeking to decolonize their 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 region or their nation and so forth. Um, to the to you know to the colonists they're terrorists. To you know the colonized they're f freedom fighters. So the patterns are, are are very similar. What is changing, of course, is as I say the the, the technology and 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 certainly the new twist on terrorism that we can't really find a precedent in history for is this emergence of kind of decentralized, franchise-based, self-radicalized terrorists who are 
radicalized on the internet, and, and, yes. and that becomes now we need to start looking at at those people, and it's going to take time. You know, to be able to profile, you need kind of a statistical database of similar behaviors that you can say are are typical of a certain type of individual. And so we've built that up for serial killers. Um, we probably are now building it up for self-radicalized um, terrorists. I suspect that a lot of these recent terrorists uh, who have kind of taken up Islam or radical Islam as an excuse to kill are similar to, you know, the high school shooters uh, 20 years ago, all right? Uh, or the, you know, postal workers who would go ballistic. Um, I suspect that half of those postal workers today would have been self-radicalized uh, terrorists. It, you know, you need some reason, whether it's shooting abortion doctors, or whether it's killing interracial couples, or whether it's taking up the cause of, of Islam. Uh, these are individuals who are already, I think, susceptible to this kind of action. All they need is a cause to unleash these kind of homicidal impulses that are, you know, that are seething inside of them. You know, the col I'm sure that, the, you know, the Columbine uh killers today probably would not have been uh you know kind of the semi goth pseudo goths they claim to be today those same individuals would have probably become self radicalized converts to to islam so uh, you know how much of it is has to do with the terrorist agenda and how much has to do with the psychopathology of you know, the, the bomber, the mass shooter, we're going to see as we kind of gather behavioral similarities and statistics on them. So, mm. you know, I'm sure we're going to be, you know, we're going to have profiles of these individuals within a decade as, as, as these statistics build up. And in terms of a terrorist agenda, we've seen some, you know, incredible um, tragedies where, you know, hundreds of people are, are killed or injured. Um, from anything from 9-11 to our London bombings here in Manchester more recently. And then we see events where um, terrorists drive cars up pavements or into a building which have a lesser impact. And I don't mean that to dismiss the, the tragedy and the trauma associated with those deaths, but I say it in terms of the, the quantity of, of deaths or injuries are significantly lower why, why would, why, what's the agenda there for a terrorist uh, group to undertake some, you know, just tragic, major tragedies and then kind of lower the impact somewhat? What, what would be the reason for that? Um, well, you know, you've got to think of what the terrorist motive is. And the terrorist motive is to provoke um, a reaction. 9-11 was, was incredibly successful because it made the United States cross, you know, the ocean and deploy troops uh, directly into combat with, with, with Al-Qaeda. It, 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 you, know, uh, you know, you look at everything that 9-11 had done um, in terms of the reaction. So, so the terrorist is essentially trying to get um, their the target to bring more recruits to them by overreacting to the terrorist threat. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's hard to describe anything, you know, when you look at the context of 9-11 um, as an overreaction to an event so horrific as 9-11 as, as was, right? But, but, you know, that was precisely the intention. Uh, you know, if, if, if terrorists wanted to shut down America, Back in September, what what you know what uh, Osama bin Laden could have done was send all those you know sixteen or twenty two hijackers one by one blowing themselves up in the McDonald's in Boise, Idaho, or in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, not in the center of the United States in New York City at the heart of of the American media, right? But in in 
isolated towns where, you know, the average American lives. That would have ground America down to a halt if Americans became afraid to walk into a Walmart or into a, a McDonald's in their own hometown, right? But, but that probably would have gotten less of a reaction from Washington. What was needed was a, a dramatic reaction, an invasion of a country, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and so that's why terrorism in many ways is, is, is you know, such a symbolic, it's almost a, like an act of propaganda, uh, and, and, and so, you know, this, 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 you have these kinds of two, uh, forms of terrorism. One is to get a reaction. The other is to, you know, slow down the, the target. And, and, and certainly again, if we look at 9-11, uh, the, you know, and, and of course the invasion of, of, of Afghanistan that resulted, um, you know, we can argue partly that it opened the door to the invasion of, of, of Iraq on, you know, on the basis that of these allegations that somehow Al Qaeda was linked to Saddam Hussein, which were never definitively um, in any way uh, proven. Uh, so, so it 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 worked. I mean, I I, I think certainly um, American security, the American economy, um, the resources that have been tied up, um, the kind of threats that uh, result to liberty in the United States, to the American Constitution, this, this notion that uh, somehow Americans now need to uh, perhaps sacrifice certain aspects of their liberty in the name of security would have been unthinkable before 2001, and, and, and here we are now. Um, so it's you know the goal is to make the target do something that's going to be beneficial to your own movement, and, and of course you know um, the policies in a way it's inescapable because one cannot imagine the United States doing nothing after 9/11. You know that that also is unimaginable. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, uh, you know, terrorism can be very powerful as it leads, leaves, you know, little option for the target than, uh, than reacting. And, and often that reaction just makes things worse. You know, the Tupamaros in Uruguay in the 1970s kind of proved that. I mean, Uruguay was considered the Switzerland of, 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 um, South America until this very small Marxist terrorist urban guerrilla, if you want to call them, insurgency, whatever you want to call them, began kidnapping and assassinating uh, Uruguayan uh, politicians and, and, and businessmen and within two years Uruguay, the Switzerland of South uh, America becomes this uh, banana republic repressive martial law state. That's what terrorists want. Hmm. Well, so the, the, the London um, where the, the, the uh, van was on the pavement, although that may not have injured or killed as many people as a, a, a bomb set off in the stadium, the impact there, as, as you're saying, would have been to, to say, well, instill a fear in the Londoners of walking along the streets. Yeah, the van on the pavement, is, of course, is frightening. Um, you know, New York now. Uh, they're investing all this money to protect sidewalks in, in, in uh, you know, what they think might be terrorist-targeted areas and prominent areas, the financial district, Times Square. Um, the, the, the sidewalks are actually now, there are going to be barriers to prevent vehicles from driving up on the sidewalk and, 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 and doing that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, in a way it's absurd, but, but of course, uh, you know, a lot of people, when you look at 9-11, uh, you know, most people did not visit the World Trade Center. You had to be uh, at that particular landmark, which was, you know, like the Statue of Liberty or the Pentagon, the World Trade Center. But a random attack on a sidewalk where you're walking, where you're, you know, it could be you, is a very frightening notion. It's, it's, it's destabilizing. Um, and then, and, and, you know, in a way, yeah, uh, it's less lethal, but in its notion, it's much more frightening and much more destabilizing. Absolutely. Yeah, and I know I haven't been in a Walmart since 9-11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you're no, no. Now, if they go and keep us out of McDonald's, then we'd be okay. Yeah, <laughs> we'd be healthier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now, now you've got this new book. It's uh, coming out in August from Penguin Random House, and it's called yes. Sons of Cain. Now, it's a history of serial killers from the Stone Age to the present. So that's a lot of ground. It's a lot of ground. It's kind of my last um, history of serial killers because I have nowhere else left to go chronologically. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my, fir my, my, my first book was essentially, you know, male serial killers roughly from, you know, the industrial age from Jack the Ripper till, till you know, I finished the book in 2000. Four, so the BTK killer was was just making a comeback when when my when my <laughs> book came out. He still hadn't been identified. Yeah. Uh, but um, of course, as 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 all this data, all uh, old newspaper accounts over the last uh, twelve years have been digitized. A lot of literature. Um, a lot of thinking about what exactly are serial killers and how are we going to define them. Um, I, I've, I've, I've come to look at, at just this phenomenon of serial killing in a longer, deeper historical and kind of evolutionary uh, context. And, and, and uh, you know, yeah. not much has changed since when my first book came out in 2004 in terms of us understanding what serial killers are and how they're created. We, in fact, we seem to realize we know less than we thought we did. We still don't know. What is it? Is it child abuse? Is it actually psychopathy? Is it, you know, uh, Asperger's syndrome? Is it biochemistry? Is it urine, you know, uh, urine chemistry? Uh, is it uh, some form of behavioral disorder? And the more studies we have, the less we realize that, that, that we know. Um, and, and, and so kind of thinking about it, um, I've come to the conclusion essentially that serial killing is deeply ingrained in the human being um, as a survival mechanism. Uh, that in the primitive time, in the Stone Age, we all had to be serial killers and serial rapists uh, because we lived in a kind of uncivilized world and it was essential to, to survival. And, and, and so it's essential to any species. You know, what I describe in my book as the four Fs. Fleeing, fighting, feeding. Yeah, baby! Right? Um, if one of those things becomes non-functioning, then the species will die out. You either flee from danger or you fight danger aggressively. Uh, you need to feed on whether it's vegetation or whether it's animal life or whether it's members of your own species, cannibals, right? And, of course, you need to have sex or else your species dies out. And, and, and so um, whether you're a rabbit or a tiger or a dog or a human being, uh, your brain is very, very hardwired to either flee, fight, feed, or f yeah, baby. Um, and 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 civilization, of course, begins to reduce the needs for these things. But our brain has not caught up to it. You know, we have, you know we we can have kind of three almost chronological um, levels to our brain. You have, you know, the first, you have the kind of primitive or the reptilian brain, the R complex, the basal ganglia. And inside the basal ganglia, you have these impulses to flee, fight, feed, or, or, or reproduce, right? And they're very, very powerful. It's our uh, kind of advanced limbic system and the neomammalian complex or the neocortex that begins to kind of moderate these reptilian brain impulses. Uh, you know, as we become civilized, it becomes inappropriate to rape. It becomes inappropriate to cannibalize. Uh, but we still have these impulses in us. Uh, they're, they're critical to our, our survival as a, as, as a species. Um, and, and, and so it's, you know, 
education, it's parental um, you know, guidance that kind of teaches us not to be serial killers, not to be cannibals, not to be necrophiles. But, but my suspicion is, is that we're essentially all born serial killers and are unmade from being serial killers by socialization, by good parenting, um, and, 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 and so forth. And, and so it's not a case of a child being made into a serial killer. It's the case of our child not being unmade. And, and, you know, I don't know how well, you know, you remember your childhood, but I remember my childhood as, as a lot of violent children around. I mean, you know, uh, biting, clawing, grabbing, fighting. Uh, children are, 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 are very, very violent. The younger they are, the more violent and impulsive they are. And, and, and you know, I think serial killers are kind of, by some reason, whether it's still biochemical or um, environmental or childhood trauma, but they're frozen into that, that primitive state. And on top of that, of course, you have neocortex, which begins to uh, kind of provide fantasies for the expression of those impulses, especially as a child becomes, um, you know, enters puberty. And, and, and so these impulses now become sexualized as well. And that's how you get serial killing, rapist, cannibal, uh, necrophiles. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, he, you know, the human species has, is at least our species, Homo sapiens, are at least 300, 400,000 years old, some would argue even a million years. Um, we've only been civilized for 20,000. Less than that even, really, agriculture begins to appear about 15,000, 12,000 years ago. So it's not been that long of a time for our brain to kind of wean these survival, very, very lethal survival impulses out of our system. You know, it's kind of like obesity, right? Obesity, building of fat on your body used to be an essential survival mechanism until modernity brings us processed, easily accessible food. And, and suddenly obesity, um, you know, is defined as obesity, as this negative destructive uh, force. I think it's the same thing for our aggressive impulse. Um, and, and so it's these, these primitive aggressive impulses that become um, as well under uh, kind of the dysfunctions of civilization become fused with the reproductive impulse, and so you get, you know, sadism, essentially. A lot of, lot of psychopathologists suggest that, you know, sadism is very, very similar to, you know, say a cat playing with its prey prior to, to consuming it. You know, it's, it's, it's essential to the hunt, that sadism is a kind of a hunting instinct, that's left over from our pre-primitive time. So, so I, you know, I tried to look at it in, 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 in that form and, and began to look at what happens when human society starts settling into villages, into towns, where people now start living with each other. Um, they have an ability to provide uh, food, they domesticate animals instead of hunting them. They plant agricultural products instead of gathering them. Our, our, our world begins to change, but it is very recent. And, and, you know, what might have been kind of predecessors to serial killers once we begin recording history, you know, the medieval and the Renaissance period and, and, and so I look, for example, at, at werewolf trials and arrests of werewolves, and when I looked at, at those trial transcripts uh, and read what these werewolves were accused of, they were typical serial killers. I mean, these, these were guys, you know, had, for example, small, uh, you know, uh, grocery stores in medieval villages, uh, where they were luring children and, 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 and killing and cannibalizing uh, children. Uh, they you know, were seen as uh, kind of, as I say, uh, you know, 
fantastic creatures, werewolves, vampires, ghouls. But when you look at what they're doing, they're uh, very similar uh, patterns to a John Wayne Gacy, for example. Um, so, so we have a lot of serial killers, and we begin to see that who they target and how they target their victim depends on, on the era. So, you know, when you begin to see, for example, uh, females entering the urban, in the in kind of in the industrial uh, age, you begin to see females entering the urban into urban geography. They're usually um, entering it as servant girls, uh, as you have a rising middle class that begins to uh, hire this 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 cheap labor, and 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 you know the middle classes want their 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 servant girls to be dressed a certain way that is appropriate to the middle class household and and. And, and so you have these fetish murders in the, starting in the late 1700s throughout the 19th century where the kind of silk dresses are, 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 are targeted. Um, women are targeted uh, fetishistically for their similarity to a servant girl, and servant girls themselves literally are targeted by numerous serial killers. So, you know, the, again, that's how economy, the society, the nature of what uh, people wear, the nature of who is degraded in society. And, of course, servant girls were looked down upon. Um, you, you know, they were, they, you know, they were, the way we often say in the 1960s, associated promiscuity um, with nurses and stewardesses, uh, in the same way, servant girls, there was an association of promiscuity with servant girls because there was this um, notion that here you have this, this, this single young woman who lives in the countryside is now in the city alone, unsupervised by her parents. Right? Uh, so, uh, you know, with time and with the nature of society, serial killers will shift, you know, to the line of least resistance, to who is being degraded. Um, and, and, you know, that's one of the reasons I think prostitutes are so often uh, targeted, because they are one of the most degraded female forms in terms of perception of, of, of society. Well, you know, before it was prostitutes, um, it was servant girls. And, and you see that as, as, we began, as I began to look at these obscure cases in the 1700s, 1800s, prior to, to Jack the Ripper. You know? So we had uh, hundreds of serial killers, typical type of sexual serial killers prior to 1888. You know, Jack the Ripper certainly wasn't the first. No. no. Um, Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Peter, when we're talking about the, the theory that you are... The, one for a better phrase, born, born a serial killer, or at least with the, those sort of requirements, you know, you need to, to do certain things to survive. Are we, as a male and female, do we differ in, in, in how we present as a serial killer? And if we do, does that begin in utero as we're formed um, um, the prior to birth, or is that something then that differs? We're all born as a serial killer, and then how we do it changes depending on gender. I, I, I think um, that, that uh, we, we, we do differ in terms of female serial kill, uh, female male, um, in terms of our aggressive capacity. And, and I, I, you know, I think the female of the species, we can imagine, for example, uh, it's very hard to imagine a female who would not become highly violent to protect her offspring, for example, mm. or a female who would do anything to protect her or her offspring, um, including uh, allying herself with a monstrous serial killer. So, I, I, you know, I, I think the kind of basic animal, female animal psychology or physiology um, is, is slightly different from the basic male animal, you know, physiology. Um, you know, males will kill their own offspring. In some species, right? Uh, females, I, I haven't yet heard of any 
female who would kill her own uh, uh, offspring systematically. So, so I think there are certainly differences, and and that's probably why, of course, there are less female serial killers than than male serial killers. So there 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 are uh, you know in some ways similarities in in the female serial killer, but I think statistically they are lesser so because uh, I think the aggressor aspect and the mating aspect is slightly different. Um, I, I, I think that the, the female chooses while the male uh, sexual impulse is less discriminatory. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, that's why it becomes rape, essentially, because the female doesn't always have in, in the animal world or in our primitive world the option to make the choice. Uh, the male has the option of using force. And, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I imagine that, that, that sex was a constant state of rape in the primitive period. You just, males had sex whenever they wanted to as long as they were the strongest male around, right? And, and, and so that's certainly, you know, the sexual reproductive impulse is so powerful, it bolsters also the need for the male to be an aggressor as well. Um, uh, the ability to unleash maximum aggression in the primitive world was essential for the male's ability to have a sexual life. And, and so, of course, uh, you have this kind of um, merge, merging uh, psychopathology between aggression and, and, and reproduction. Uh, you, know, it, it, you know, it was literally dog-eat-dog, dog, as they say. In, in, in that time, we were in a constant state of either running away uh, or killing what we were running away from, if we could kill it, uh, fighting each other, um, and uh, raping each other. It was just that's all we did, and cannibalizing when we needed to do it. You know, so it's just that's kind of where we humans come out of. Yeah. If we believe that we are. Um, maybe more nurturing as women. I mean, some some women never choose to have children. They cannot bond with children. Um, and I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if we if we think about women being differently different in in serial killer terms because of that more nurturing need, do we create that difference? Is it, is it the nature nurture debate? I guess I'm thinking if we're all born in the same similar situation, we're all out to survive. So we have this killer instinct. We're influenced well, as parents, aren't we? Yeah, it, um, you know, I mean, there are males who don't reproduce as, 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 as well, uh, but, uh, you know, all these kinds of, in the past, those that didn't reproduce, those that weren't strong enough to contribute a defense to the tribe or to the clan would die. That's not the case anymore, um, but that's a very recent phenomenon. Let me say that's about you know it's only once we become civilized in the last fifteen thousand years that we begin to see, for example, people living a longer age. That that uh, you know around the time we start seeing cave drawings emerging, uh, where people start developing a kind of um, you know the argument is is what makes us human is uh, the fear of the dead, necrophobia. And, and um, we start seeing the emergence of necrophobia by looking at archaeological traces in, in primitive graves. And, and we begin to see that about this time that we become civilized is around the time where we can uh, date graves that indicate a fear of the dead. For example, um, legs of corpses are broken, or their feet and hands are tied, or heavy stones are put upon the body to prevent it from rising. Um, I mean, that's the origin of the tombstone, of course, in cemeteries. Those upright stones used to lie flat to keep the buried beneath the ground from rising and taking vengeance against the living. 
Um, and, and that is probably the development of empathy, where we begin to empathize with the dead. And, and as we look at these, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're called vampire graves, for example, because it's as if people are pinned down to prevent them from rising up as, as, as vampires almost. Um, and, and, and so we begin to see social organization. We begin to see um, kind of familial roots and care for the aged and, and, and so forth beginning to emerge around the same period that these vampire graves are, 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 are being identified um, as coming from that time. So that's, you know, probably the civilizational impulse. But again, you know, on the scale of how long we've been physiologically as a species around um, to how long we've been civilized, it's, it's very short. You know, like I said, civilization's around 15,000 years at, at, at best. Um, as a human species, we've been around for hundreds of thousand years. And, of course, if you look at hominids, you know, Neanderthal man, other types of, of upright walking species, uh, they've been around a lot longer. In fact, that's the argument, that the reason Homo sapiens have been able to conquer um, the, 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 the uh, you know, previous species is that Homo sapiens are the first ones who develop a fear of the dead and stop cannibalizing each other because of that fear. That, uh, you know, um, if you look at uh, several previous species to, to, to humans, including Neanderthals, they actually had bigger brains. They were stronger than humans. They made weapons just the same as humans did. I mean, Neanderthals uh, could make stone weapons, and yet humans, who are smaller have smaller brains, were able to conquer and eliminate the Neanderthals in this kind of genocidal war roughly, you know, about 50,000 years ago in Europe. Uh, and, you know, why is that? And one of the theories is that the humans developed necrophobia, that Neanderthals not only fought humans, but also killed each other wantonly, like serial killers. Humans developed necrophobia, um, and begin to hesitate to kill within their own species. And, and, and so necrophobia is this kind of evolutionary impulse. Um, uh, you, know, if, 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 you know, if there's God or if there's kind of nature, whatever it is, that uh, kind of makes species evolve towards surviving better uh, than the previous hominid, Human type species, um, the one thing that 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 wasn't working was their ability to aggress against each other, uh, particularly when they learned the ability to make tools. And so, once Neanderthals had this ability to make weapons, uh, they go at each other with those weapons as much as they did against species. And the other thing you got to look at too, as well, is is the the better equipped a species is for destroying its enemy, the lower its aggressive, aggressive impulse. You know, tigers, for example, or lions have a very low aggressive impulse uh, amongst themselves, where pigeons or rats, smaller animals, humans, are very, very, very aggressive with each other. So humans were not particularly well-equipped for fighting. We didn't have claws. We didn't have thick pelts. We didn't have these, these canine teeth. Um, and, and so we had a very high level of aggressive capacity in us. But then something freaky happens. We develop an ability to make weapons. And suddenly we are these soft, aggressive beings with highly lethal weapons Right, stone weapons, arrowheads, spears, uh, flint knives, but we have this high level of aggression. That's what makes humans dangerous. And, and so necrophobia was essential to um, kind of demilitarize, de-aggressivize this kind of very aggressive species that through some freak of nature has developed an ability to make lethal weapons. Mm. So now, 
in this book, um, when do, when does it? Uh, how do, how do people pre-order right now? Um, it's available on Amazon, iBooks, and uh, definitely if you go to Amazon.com. It's it's available for pre-order. Uh, you know, any, anywhere you buy books, uh, online at least, certainly. Um, I'm not sure. You know, it's been it's been about five years since I published a book, and, and half the bookstores I used to go to already are gone. So yeah. I am just mystified what's going to happen with this book in, in, in terms of bookstores, what kind of impact it's, it's, it's going to have on my... Of, yeah. you know my 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 work because certainly you know my previous books have been in in, in bookstores everywhere yeah. but but those bookstores are not out there anymore yeah the world's changing so yeah you know so as authors we're all living in 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 this changing rapidly changing world that between you know your last book and your next book you you have no sense of what the world is 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 is, is going to be like or what impact that's going to have on on how you sell your book, yeah. But it is available, as I say, on Amazon, on you know, iBooks, or, you know, most platforms, all platforms. It's right. available. And you can always go to your uh, uh, your website, right? The um, petervronsky.org. dot org. Yeah. Right. That's Which will give you links to to all my books and to you know everything I'm doing. Quite a bit too. Well, it's always a pleasure. Um, wow, you you just know the you know killing so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know that's what history is, right? Uh, I tell my students, you know, they wonder how come a guy uh, who writes about serial killers is teaching international relations. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, <laughs> international relations history is all about serial killers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, again, thank you very much, Peter, for being on the show. Uh, thanks for having me on. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.